الرحمن الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على رسولك الكریم علامہ صلی وسلی مبارک علیہ سیدنا محمد وعلا علیہ وصحابہ اجمعین Today, inshallah, we are going to look at a very special publication, The Quran Be Held. Uh, this is the 136th English translation of the Quran. And those who know that this work was in the making for the last 15 or more, more years, actually, uh, were very excited to uh, see the publication actually uh, happening. And uh, so in it is with this uh, great deal of uh, expectation that uh, this publication has been received. We are going to look at this translation in several sessions. And the first one is just the beginning of what is said in the introduction of the work. We should remember that this publication has come out almost four centuries after the first publication of the English translation by Alexander Ross. This is a terrible publication. This was one of the worst translations, well, the first translation, and it wasn't even from the Arabic. And he called it a newly English for the satisfaction of all that desire to look into the Turkish vanities. So he called the Quran Turkish vanities. And there is a reason for this because the Ottomans, when they arrived in Vienna, uh, it was an unsuccessful event, but uh, they left such terror uh, in the European mindset, in the U European psyche of the, of the Muslims, that henceforth people looked at Islam uh, through the eyes of this invasion. So it was called Turkish vanities. And the second translation that came out uh, from the Arabic uh, wasn't even much better. George Sale, he produced it almost a century after Alexander Ross, 1734. And then we have several others. Uh, this is before the 19th century or 20, before the 20th century. And uh, it's only in the 20th century that Muslims started to produce translations, English translations of the Quran. And therefore this 136th translation, English translation of the Quran is of special importance because uh, it, number one, it will be viewed within the context and within the history of translations of the Quran in English language. In the 20th century, there have been 60 translations. And just in the first 17 years of the 21st centuries, we have 46 translations. And this information comes from this uh, work by Bruce Lawrence, uh, the Quran in English a biography. It's not a very good work. It's not even accurate. It doesn't even list uh, the very first English translation in the 20th century by Muslims. But nevertheless, uh, this is an approximate number, 136 translations. We are told that uh, this work has come into existence through a very special process, which involved uh, Sheikh Ali Hani and Nuh Hamim Keller. For the first seven years, Sheikh Ali explained every single word of the Quran based on the tafasirs. And uh, after seven years, when one would have expected the English translation to be compiled and put together, uh, we are told that uh, Nuha Min Karar realized that during this process, the ability of uh, Sheikh Ali had increased to such an extent and his own understanding had increased to such an extent that it would be worthwhile to repeat the whole process. So the initial translation was set aside and for the next eight long years, they went over uh, every single word one more time. And this is how this work came into existence. 
the the first question that arises in uh, readers mind of course is uh, if this is the process then whose work is this is this the work of Sheikh Ali Hani or is it the work of Nuha Mim Kaler? And uh, if it's a combined joint effort, then wouldn't it be better to have Sheikh Ali's name on the very title as well, instead of a small print mention uh, inside the text? Uh, but that's something, and it is important to, to know because uh, there are, who is going to be responsible for what is being said? So that part needs to be uh, fully understood. The um, I see that. Uh, let me just move the uh, move this thing out of the way. So that one can see the see the slide. The next phase that we are uh, told about is that after the translation had been published, Noon Keller's wife compared it with six, six of the best previous translations. And uh, that comparison brought out But we are told uh, certain aspect of the meanings in Arabic, which were not considered by any of the previous translators. And these six who, which, translations which are not identified are said to be the best among the previous translations, which means 135 previous translations. We are told that uh, this was further verified by Nukhalar uh, through asking Professor Ahmad Khan, who is at the American University in Cairo, and who was preparing a, an article for general publication on the previous translations of the Quran. And he also confirmed that the entire collection of previous translations is inferior to this translation because they had missed certain aspects of the Quran, of the Arabic of the Quran, and this is the first time in the 400-year 400 400 year history of uh, English translations that we have, a translation that pays attention to uh, these aspects of the Arabic of the Quran. This is a very big claim, to say the least. And uh, this claim is being made on the authority of translator's wife and Professor Ahmad. There is no documented evidence of the scholarly accomplishments of the translator's wife and if you go on the website of the American University in, of Cairo, Professor Ahmed is said to be someone who specializes in four areas, heresy and orthodoxy in medieval Islam, the early Islamic empire, classical Islamic sciences, and print in the Islamic world. Now, none of these Come, many, come close to the Quran itself or the English translations of the Quran. So we are left with two statements uh, about the superiority. This translation is superior to the existing translations because translator's wife claims that and Professor Ahmed claims that. And both of them are not known to be the scholars uh, in the field of Quran translations. However, substantially, the claim of superiority of the Quran be held rests on matters of Arabic meaning in the Quran that no previous trans English translation has seriously incorporated. Unquote, page, uh, page 14 of the introduction. 
what does matters of Arabic meaning mean? Perhaps um, what is meant here is the nuanced aspects of Arabic language and Allah knows best. But let's look at, uh, let's look at what is being said. We are told that the number of uh, meanings, the as uncovered matters of Arabic meaning in the Quran that no previous English translation has seriously incorporated. We now turn for brevity to just seven of the most significant to show their importance in understanding the original text. As we all know, in uh, the encyclopedic work on uh, the sciences of the Quran, Jalaluddin Siyuti has actually devoted a whole chapter, his 40th chapter of the work, wherein he lists 80 matters, if we can use that term, matters of Arabic meaning, whatever that means, not seven as even like seven is not, it's just an ad hoc number. But nevertheless, the first one that we are told is summa. Now we are told that uh, the first is the conjugating, conjugative adverb summa, which in, invariably appears in past translations as and or the then, indicating the simple succession in time between what it uh, co-joins. Whereas we are told that in the classical works on uh, the language of the Quran, uh, Thumma is much more than that. So just to be briefly explaining what, what is being said here, is that Thumma uh, in all previous translations has been translated as and or then. Uh, but it has more aspects than as and then, and this is the first translation that is incorporating those aspects. This is well known, like in, in our own tradition, Din Suti himself he says that Thalatha uh, Amur, Thumma, Harfun Yaktadi Thalatha Amur, the the particle thumma, her thumma has three important matters, and uh, there is khilaf, difference of opinion on all three. The first one is sharing in the command, at the shriku fil hukm. The second is wa tartib, and the third is wal muhla. Uh, Sharing in the command, sequential occurrence of something, and delay. Well, mohla. Meaning, when we say summa, yani we say ja zaid, summa amr. Zaid came, and then amr came. Meaning, there is a sequential occurrence. One thing happens, and then another thing happens. First of all, Nukala translates this into disparity. Disparity in time, disparity in time to express perpetuity, disparity in rank, tarahi, uh, rutabi. Tarahi itself is mistransliterated and disparity is perhaps not a very accurate translation of delay uh, or sequential occurrence. Uh, because uh, in most of the tafasirs, uh, we do have mention of these, as uh, is, is uh, mentioned in the introduction here. But the reference that we are given is the excellent article of a contemporary scholar. And uh, we are told to look into that article. That article is a very short article. It, it doesn't really give us the depth. 
But the question is, if people are referred to an Arabic text in a translation, for whom is this translation? People who cannot read Arabic, they will be reading this translation. Then we are referred back to, uh, to an Arabic text. Nevertheless, uh, what is really important for us to see is the claim that no previous translation has paid attention to these aspects of the usage of thumma in the Quran. Let's take an example from Surah Taha, uh, the 82nd verse of, of uh, Surah Taha has وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ لِمَنْ ثَابَ وَآمَنَا عَامِلَ صَالِحًا ثُمَّ اَخْتَدَى Now this uh, adverb thumma here does not convey a sequential occurrence. The translation, uh, which is uh, very well translated in, uh, in this uh, translation, then ever after remains firmly guided. And verily, I am ever forgiving to whoever repents and believes and works righteousness, then ever after remains firmly guided. Meaning, uh, summa here does not mean that first Allah SWT is saying that he is ever forgiving, then for, for the one who seeks, who repents, and then he does and then he does the righteous deeds. And after he's after doing that, he's guided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying that he is ghafar upon the man who repents and does the good deeds, and then he's guided. So the so which is very clear uh, in the translation in the Quran beheld, but the claim is that no other previous translation has incorporated this particular aspect of summa, and this is the first time in 400 years that we have this. If we look at the previous translations, just random selection here, Muhammad Asad, who has other problems in his translation, but in this verse, he says, thereafter keeps to the right path, summa khtada. We have Shakir saying, then continues to follow the right guidance. Mustafa Khattab then persists on true guidance. Abdul Hai then remains guided. And the Riyabadi thereafter uh, let himself remain guided. So the claim that uh, these six matters of Arabic meaning that no previous translation has been serious, has seriously incorporated is, uh, is not accurate. We just saw it in one example. If we want to go into the other examples, uh, other six, other other six matters of Arabic meaning, whatever that means, we find similar cases where many previous translations has taken have taken into consideration what is cl being claimed here. Uh, let's just take one more: the emphatic indefinite, according to Keller has been uniformly rendered in previous translations the same way it is normally denoted in English. That is, by the decidedly unemphatic indefinite article A or N before them. The emphasis here is in the original of this quote. What is being said that no previous translation has paid attention to the emphatic indefinite. Let's take an example from Surah Al-Ma'idah. This is the 31st ayah. And Allah sent a crow, a huraban, probing the earth to show him how to hide the shameful remains of his brother. Keller comments, quote, the word crow is indefinite. That is any sort of crow, while the earth is definite, namely the earth beneath our feet, which we all know, unquote. So just to be clear, what is being said here 
is that the primary meaning of the nakira indefinite in Arabic is not known. It is the opposite of the marifa, which is denoted by al. Missing the, this emphatic indefinite is probably the greatest single leak of meaning and nuanced nuance in prior English translation. This is the actual text in this work on page 17. Missing this emphatic indefinite is probably the greatest single leak of meaning and nuance in prior English translations. All seem to have made a false analogy between modern written Arabic, which no longer uses the indefinite for such purposes, and the Arabic of the Quran, which everywhere does. So it's hard to really grant even any kind of generosity. Um, I mean, this is the text of this work, which was produced after 15 years, and it claims that no previous translation has done what it is doing. That's, uh, you know, that's probably a typo. But regardless of that, let's just look at the claim once again. We are told that no previous translation has paid attention to the emphatic indefinite. Just take the same example in Surah Al-Maidah, Ayah 31. What do we have here? In this translation, if we look at the Ayah of the, uh, itself, فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ غُرَابًا يَبْحَثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيُرِيَهُ كَيْفَ يُوَارِ سَوْآتَ أَهِي Keller translates far as and, which actually eliminates the sequential characteristics of the Quranic narrative. Because if we look at this whole narration here, uh, this is the story of the two sons of Adam alayhi salam. One of them, uh, they are both offered their uh, offering, and one's offering is accepted and the other's not accepted. So there is a sequential character to the narrative itself. By translating fa as and, that emphasis on sequential occurrence is taken away. Many other translators, they translate fa as then or thereupon. Thereupon, now the second thing is, Keller translates basa as sent just as most other translators do, but there are translators who actually use appointed. Now, Yabhathu fil earth is translated as probing the earth. What does probing the earth mean? Especially in the case of a crow, probing the earth. The Rabadi and several others, they use scratching the earth. I'm not saying that those other translations don't have their own problems, like the study Quran. But the point being made is that the claim here that no other translation has paid attention to these matters is not factually accurate. Shameful remains of his brother is not in the original text. The original text simply says Sauta Ahi. Sauta Ahihi, which is translated by many other translators as his brother's nakedness. Where is the shameful in adjective in the text of the Quran itself? The, the, the other five, other four matters of uh, meaning matters of Arabic meaning are similar. I don't want to go into the details, but the seventh matter that is mentioned here uh, is not really a matter of Arabic meaning. Rather, uh, this is 
this is not a matter of Arabic meaning, but the claim here is so huge. We are told all previous translations have an over-reliance on English Arabic dictionaries, previous translators, or even biblical renderings. Subhanallah. This is a huge claim because we are making a judgment on 135 translations produced over a period of four centuries. Over-reliance on English Arabic dictionaries, previous translators, or even biblical renderings. This is uh, infactual, it's not correct. And the example given is of Jannah. The word Jannah, um, we are told that the Jannah in the verse, and we said, O Adam, dwell in peace, you and your wife, in the lush, laded, lush shaded grove of paradise, Al Jannah. Does the word Jannah primarily signify a grove of trees whose shade is so dense it blocks out all sunlight? We are told a garden seldom reaches above chest level and hence does not bear the Quranic implications very well. So the point being made here is that all previous translations have used the word garden for Jannah, which is number one, inaccurate because that's not what the Quranic meaning is. Number two, it's biblical. And instead it should be lush shaded grove of paradise. Now we all know that garden means different things to different people in different places. Like in North America, uh, when we say garden, people understand by that a small space behind in, in, the, in the backyard where you grow your, gar your vegetables. In England, it perhaps most often means uh, a place full of flowers. In the Indian subcontinent, a garden means something totally different. And uh, we use garden in the sense of uh, an orchard and where the trees can be as tall as 30 feet. So that doesn't really convey the concept. And if you look at the Mufradat of uh, Raghavala Sfahani, um, we really look at, uh, you know, Raghavala Sfahani is just, just an amazing scholar we have. And he tells us uh, the root meaning is to hide something. And because Jannah appears 147 times in the Quran, and to translate it as lush, uh, lush grove in all cases would perhaps be an overstretch. So this is just the first of the several in-depth uh, looks into this work because um, it's important for us to place it within its context. It's important for us to look at the claims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and the ability to keep his book as the supreme loyalty. I understand this is maybe difficult for some people who have personal loyalties to the translators. But ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنا ما في الآخرة حسنا وقينا عذاب النار رب يغفر ورحم أنت خير الراحمين يا الله أنت هليم كريم عظيم تهب العفو فعف ونا يا كريم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله in the next session we will look at some other aspects of this translation السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته